Um, thanks very much. I really appreciate the chance to speak. Um, maybe first of all, to say a little bit about uh, uh, physical location is always useful. So I'm speaking to you actually from Western Canada, from Canmore, Alberta, where I've been for the whole COVID period, pretty much. Uh, beautiful mountains. I've been lucky to uh, be able to get out and do some ice climbing. That was a big climb of a month ago or so. Um, so very different world than probably many of you in London. And in fact, just to give a sense of the, the global and the local environmental problems, right after this, I'm <clears throat> trying to squeeze in a talk to our town council to try and uh, argue about the climate impacts of some development that will be happening soon, uh, arguing against development. So that gives you a sense of all the complicated policy here. Um, here's how I want to think about this. I'm going to start by just outlining the simplest version of how what the context is of where I think solar geoengineering or solar climate intervention, whatever you want to call it, fits into the set of things that, that ways that we might respond to the climate uh, emergency. <clears throat> you can think of this as, as a, uh, a causal chain, economy, economic activity, drives emissions, drives CO2 concentrations, there's a climate response, and, and that makes climate hazards in the IPCC language, and then there's climate impacts that come from those hazards to borrow this think, very good structured language from IPCC. And there are basically four things that we can do to intervene in that chain. The thing that we absolutely must do, in my view, one of the few things you can say with confidence is decarbonize the economy, switch over the industrial infrastructure of our economy from high carbon to zero carbon. And uh, uh, nothing I'm going to say about solar geoengineering or anything else removes the necessity to do that. And I also want to say I've spent a lot of time working on decarbonization policy, and I believe it is absolutely doable. There are real trade-offs about how fast we do it. There are real challenges, but there's no question we can find ways to, to have an a, a economy that provides lots of the things we want uh, at, at, with no net emissions. The next thing we can do is carbon removal. Uh, carbon removal uh, breaks the link between emissions and concentrations in the sense that it, uh, uh, decarbonization breaks the link between economic activity and emissions. I'm happy to come back to carbon removal in questions. Uh, uh, but I'll say that I believe there's a, a certain level of overhype uh, and kind of techno optimism around carbon removal right now that um, uh, uh, is blinding people to the scale of the environmental and economic trade-offs of doing it. And that it actually presents at this point some significant moral hazard in that uh, uh, it actually makes it appear that we can uh, do things about net emissions more easily than we probably really can and may distract from the central thing that my view is that we should be doing a policy, which is decarbonization. Um, the next thing is solar geoengineering, the, the topic of, of this talk, which at best partially and imperfectly breaks or weakens the link between concentrations and resulting climate changes, but it introduces new risks, both physical and political. We'll get to those in a second. And then of course, all the local adaptation measures. So very quickly, I'm gonna assume a bunch of people have seen some of this before. Here's the set of things I include in this grab bag of things called solar geoengineering or solar climate intervention. Uh, this is sort of organized uh, uh, in two columns here, things that alter the short wave and things that alter the long wave. Of course, in reality, any of these do a little bit of both. But from my point of view, while these things are very different in their uh, risks, cost, technical uncertainty, there's some uh, continuity between them in terms of the way they fit into the, the larger set of things we can do about uh, climate and and the way they bear certain sort of similar risks and, and, and technical uncertainties. Here's a little bit more about how I think about the, the trade-offs of them from a paper and actually philosophical transactions of a couple of years back. Uh, uh, happy to come back to this in background, but I think I'm simply going to assume that most of you have heard a fair amount before about details of some of these technologies. I'm going to start by talking about what the risks are and giving you something which is pretty new, a taxonomy I've been working on that tries to lay out one structured view of how to think about the overall risks of these technologies. Then I'll discuss some evidence about what the benefits of them might be, then talk about uh, uh, policy and what I believe are the hard policy choices around building a serious research program. And then I'd really appreciate uh, questions because from my point of view, the questions and dialogue about this are really the most important thing. So here's a kind of top level view uh, 
of, of this uh, uh, taxonomy of risks. So at the top level, I have basically four categories of risks. Physical risks, as opposed to political risks, of benevolent deployment. Benevolent doesn't mean omniscient. That includes errors and all the normal accidents that come from complex systems. Then there's a set of risks around inducing conflict. Then there's a set of risks of reducing mitigation, which is, I think, often not quite correctly called moral hazard. And then there's risks in changing the relationship between humans and the natural world. So let me dive into these a little bit. Um, for benevolent, for the physical risks of benevolent deployment, I believe there's three top level categories. So one uh, is the risks of making the radio deforcing. Uh, uh, you know, it's very common in, in, in um, climate science, climate dynamics. We think about really dividing up uh, um, uh, climate forcing and climate response. Of course, that division isn't perfect because there's uh, feedbacks and connections between them, but I think it's a very useful division. So to me, there's one set of risks that are the risks of any particular way that we would engineer or alter the radiative forcing, intervene in the radiative forcing. And those risks are, of course, very much dependent on the specific way you uh, uh, alter the radio forcing. They uh, are almost completely different for different categories of solar geoengineering. So I've just listed a few there. You can make a long list. Of, we've got lists of hundreds, um, but the obvious famous one, the risk of ozone loss from putting uh, sulfates in the stratosphere or the increased methane lifetime that might come from adding uh, iodine from sea salt from, from rain cloud brightening. That's just scra scratching the surface. Then there's a set of risks that come from the climate response. And to me, the risk there, said carefully, is exacerbation. So if you think about some uh, radio forcing from solar geoengineering, that radio forcing will reduce the net global average radio forcing. That's the whole point. But it's not anti CO2. That radio forcing is not the exact opposite of the radio forcing from CO2. And so we shouldn't expect the climate response to be the exact opposite. In some places, the climate response will be to drive some climate variable back towards pre-industrial, which is moderating climate change. But in other cases, it may drive some climate variable away from pre-industrial, which is exacerbating climate change. So increased droughts, for example, would be a risk or precipitation reduced below pre-industrial. Reducing precipitation is not a risk. That may be a goal if, if precipitation is up from increased CO2 and you are pushing it back towards pre-industrial, if climate risk is proportional to the distance away from pre-industrial, then, then that uh, is not a risk, but it would be a risk if you're moving, moving the precip below pre-industrial. Um, then the third category, which still count to me as the physical risks of benevolent deployment, are risks that come from accidents. Any complex technological system has all sorts of accidents and has, I think, a kind of a normal accident mode one can think about. So that includes the um, uh, termination due to a failure of the, of the deployment system, uh, as well as deployment system errors. Again, there's a, a, a bunch more one can say in detail. I want to give you a sense of the complexity underneath. So here's just one particular figure from one paper that we worked on to try and calculate the um, um, ground level impacts to air quality from stratospheric aerosols. So stratospheric aerosols, uh, the, the obvious risk is if you're putting aerosols in the atmosphere, it seems to me it's kind of a moral imperative. You have to think about the human health risks of aerosols. And so we know that, that aerosols have an enormous human health risk, you know, global mortality of over 5 million a year now. So we started an effort to look at that with some kind of state-of-the-art models. But the more we, we worked on it, the more we realized it was very complicated because, well, uh, we thought about just this direct risk, that, you know, putting aerosols in the stratosphere that are coming down to the surface, they're a health hazard, and we use the standard health metrics. It turns out that these indirect pathways are much bigger, uh, both for particulate matter and for ground level ozone. So that's just one little uh, example scratching the surface. And it's an example that shows that, well, you can, I think, and it's useful to divide up the risks of making the radio forcing from the exacerbation risks, that is the climate response, you can't completely untangle those two. They're they inherently tangled. Okay, so now induced conflict. It seems to me there are really two categories of risks here. One category of risk, the obvious one, is weaponization. And that's been a concern that goes back really to the 1960s, uh, uh, where there was a, a high level concern about um, weaponization of, of weather and climate control. This was formally a kind of a top uh, level 
uh, at the science establishment of both the U.S. and the USSR at the time. Uh, some of you may know that the, the U.S. actually used uh, weather control as a, as a weapon in the Vietnam War over the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and as a result of that, we have the NMOD Treaty. Um, there's ideas about counter geoengineering. There's ideas about deliberate termination. So, so you'll notice that I do not have termination risk as a top level risk because I don't think it is. I think it, it really depends on how it happens. So I've got it in two different places. If the termination is deliberate, that is somebody blows up the system um, or, or, or somehow interferes with force in a malevolent way, that's one kind of termination risk and the other kind is accidental and they are very different in their structure. Then there's the, the question of exacerbation of existing conflicts, even without active malevolence, simply adding the uh, solar geoengineering might exacerbate existing conflicts. One way to think about this is a kind of crowding out effect, to use the economist language, that there's limited political attention and trying to both solve all the stuff we have to do about cutting emissions and all the other problems the world has, adding solar geoengineering just makes it uh, harder to get to solutions would be the, the concern here. Then there's you know, what for many people is the central concern, I believe, which uh, I'm calling here reduced mitigation uh, um, or moral hazard. I believe there's really several different things under here that are, that are distinct. Um, one of them is a, um, uh, um, a, a collective versus private interest conflict. So private interests, oil companies or petrostates, uh, have an incentive to exaggerate the benefits of solar geoengineering uh, uh, because they don't want to see emissions cuts uh, and they will exploit that uh, uh, in some way. But then there's a separate kind of collective addiction problem. A fundamental fact is, is, is cutting emissions provides this very long-term benefit, uh, but that means a lot of the benefits of cutting emissions are spread in the far future, whereas solar geoengineering produces a short-term benefit to the extent that it does, we'll get to that in a second, but no long-term benefit. And so there's an obvious kind of addictive risk and, and hence these, I think, quite useful analogies between uh, um, solar geoengineering and the idea that you have some kind of um, methadone or, or um, uh, you know, morphine or something to mask the pain of some medical condition, but not actually dealing with the underlying condition. So I think there's definitely a collective addiction risk. And then it's important to say that, that it is rational to decrease CO2 emissions in an, in an optimal policy sense, in re, if there is solar geoengineering. That is, if you are choosing your um, speed of emissions cuts based on some trade-off between the cost, social, both direct economic cost and, and other social environmental costs of very rapid emissions cuts against the benefits, if you're doing some trade-off like that, if solar geoengineering reduces in any way the risks from, from uh, climate, then it's actually rational to cut emissions a little uh, more slowly. You still have to cut them, but a little more slowly. But that means there's more CO2 uh, uh, than there would be in a world without solar geoengineering, and that has long-term consequences. Finally, there's uh, a set of risks that are to do with, with humans' relationship to the natural world. One of them is, is the idea that, 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 that there's a, a larger extent to which you know, human political processes are determining um, weather and, and climate potentially. And that, that is, you know, in the, in the sort of beautiful words of, of Bill McKibben, I think makes the earth feel more like an artifact. It's more like the end of nature. But I'm actually more concerned about a kind of slippery slope to enhancement. So my personal interest in these technologies is purely to, uh, as an additional way to reduce the human and environmental risks of climate change. So my view is that a combination of emissions cuts and solar geoengineering might offer us significantly lower risks than emissions cuts alone. But that's just my view. It's completely plausible uh, that these technologies could be used to uh, enhance the climate for human welfare. Uh, if you wanted to maximize global primary productivity, you might want to have higher CO2 than pre-industrial and have a flatter pole to equator gradient. I'm not advocating that. I would actually fight against it. But uh, uh, there are utilitarian arguments for it. And I think that that's a risk of developing these technologies that they will be ultimately used for that purpose. So now let me talk a little bit about the benefits. Um, I'm gonna do this pretty quickly because I think the bigger issues are really about risk, but I'll, I'll, I'll do it in a few parts. I'm gonna show results from a couple of papers I've been involved in, but these papers are in fact very similar to many other papers that have been written. And I'll, I'll get to why I think you should take these results seriously in a second. So, the results I'm showing you now are from a paper that used the uh, 
GFDL quarter degree model. Uh, GFDL had never really been involved in solar geoengineering before, and we ended up uh, an interesting kind of collaboration that developed. That model was, uh, there are lots of high resolution models now, but it was an, a particularly good ultra high resolution model that did a very good job on, uh, on, on extreme precipitation and in particular on tropical cyclones. So we put together a collaboration, partly dealing with tropical cyclones with Kerry Emanuel joined. Um, and we ran that model. In this case, we were, uh, uh, the solar geoengineering simulation was just um, one of these turn down the sun simulations. Well, lots of different things that are good and bad about different models. So that's very unrealistic in terms of say, it doesn't capture stratospheric aerosols. But on the other hand, the actual underlying model is in some ways a very uh, high quality model. Um, uh, the model we used was not maybe that that novel. The thing that I think we, we did was novel was more carefully than people had done before, we tried to think about what is the right way to test whether or not uh, benefits or risks are um, uh, uh, to one extent that are regional. The big concern uh, for a long time, a concern that I and many people had voiced, you know, a decade or two ago, was that solar geoengineering was inherently very unequal. And so, part of the goal here was to understand how unequal it might be. So, what we did first of all is use the standard IPCC SREX regions because uh, we don't want to cherry pick. It's easy to produce papers that show that solar geoengineering is great or awful if you cherry pick the result. But the idea here was we're just going to use these standard SRX regions, and then we're going to choose some variables that are, you know, according to IPCC and, and elsewhere, very important uh, climate hazards that in turn determine impacts. And the variables we focused on were average temperature, extreme temperature, basically hottest hour during the year, and there's enormous evidence that's one of the single most important drivers of, of human impacts, um, water availability, precip minus evaporation, and extreme precip, that is the max over five days. So those are the, the four variables we looked at the most. We looked at precip as well, and the thing basically does the same thing for precip, but I think precip is actually a less useful variable when you're also changing evaporation. It's extreme precip, that is, a, is an impact that drives you know, storm damage and so on. And it's change in water availability that, that is the thing that, that, that also matters. And then for each of these variables, we're comparing the, the, the case with and without solar geoengineering. And we're asking whether the solar geoengineering makes the climate variable in a statistically significant sense, move towards pre-industrial, which we call moderated, which means less climate change, which you generally think of as better, or exacerbated, meaning moving away from pre-industrial, which means more climate change, which means worse. And then we code them about whether they're statistically significant. And the big kind of result here, which is truly surprising, is that there's not a single variable in any area was exacerbated significantly. I feel kind of ashamed showing this because it, it feels like we had to have sort of cooked the books to produce such a good result. Um, there are certainly models that produce different results, but then in fact, it is the result we got for the very first trial we tried that analysis method on this uh, 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 data. And I think this analysis method is, is a, from my point of view, a pretty sensible way to, to look at it. Um, we recently did this again using the same analysis method. There's some stuff under the hood here that I'm not telling you, but using basically the same analysis method on the uh, GLENS, this, this is a high resolution model set, um, ensemble model with um, stratospheric aerosols using the uh, Wacom high top model at NCAR that has a good stratospheric sulfur cycle. Um, and we did the same thing again, in this case, you do see that uh, P minus C is exacerbated in four locations, but it turns out that in all four of those locations, it actually gets wetter. And this gets to the interesting question about what's better or worse. So many people, people who live say uh, here might well think that a little more water was a good thing in terms of direct human benefits, a little more agricultural P minus C, but on the other hand, if you're a, a Atacama desert tortoise, you might think it was a terrible thing. And, and so I think, you know, my view is we should take mostly the ecocentric view and believe that 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 we want to minimize climate change away from pre-industrial period. Um, then one more uh, uh, thing to show quickly on on potential benefits, just showing you something new. This is a paper that just got accepted a week or so ago in, in Nature of Food uh, that is uh, uses what appears to be, according to its its proponents the sort of most consistent thorough crop model built into a modern GCM. It's the, the built into the, the uh, built into the NCAR um, CESM model. Um, and there's been a bunch of stuff back and forth on, on validating that model and comparing it to the Proctor et al results. 
but I'll just show you the bottom line here. So this shows you a global average crop yield in tons per hectare. This shows you the, 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 the baseline. This is an 8.5 scenario. This is a 4.5 scenario. And this is the 8.5 plus SRM. The key thing we were doing in this paper, which I think is a useful framing, is to compare um, different forms, in this case, three different methods of solar geoengineering, um, compare them and also emissions cuts uh, 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 when they're doing the same thing in terms of making the same change in net ready forcing. So basically in all of these, we're going between RCP 8.5 and 4.5 and basically comparing the effect of doing that with emissions cuts to the effect of doing that with these different kinds of solar geoengineering. And there's pretty interesting results about the effect of local relative humidity, but the net effect is that solar geoengineering is actually more effective in protecting agriculture than is an emission cut for the same uh, uh, change in temperature or net ready to forcing. So why should you take any of this seriously? An obvious answer, an obvious question that many people have is to say, well, these are just model results. Well, the answer is, of, of course, they're just model results. But at some level, the same is true about our projections of future climate change. And I think the challenge for those of you who might really want to say these results should be just set aside is to think about how you can set these results aside and not set aside many of the kind of core results uh, of climate change. I think it's important to say that I've shown you some models, there's a whole bunch more, but what there are not are papers that use uh, uh, modern climate models, uh, uh, use solar geoengineering in the sense that I'm talking about it, that is, is a supplement to emissions cuts, use it where you're doing pretty even uh, uh, application, north to south, east to west, uh, zonally uh, even application. There's, I think, no models that do that that, that produce really substantially different results than I'm showing, that is, results that show uh, uh, no, no or small benefits of solar geoengineering or very unequal uh, benefits or very large harms. What we do have is models that show that there are ways to do solar geoengineering that produce terrible results. No question. If you do it only in one hemisphere, you shift the ITCZ, all sorts of awful results. There's no question you could do solar geoengineering in ways that are enormously destructive, but, but that doesn't invalidate the claim that if you did it in some way that was attempting to be uh, uh, beneficial, the benefits could be pretty large. But the underlying question really is how confident we should be. To be clear, all major climate models have been used for this now. The results are consistent between climate models. There have been, you know, of order many hundreds to a thousand papers that have addressed this. But I still think there's lots of room for deep systematic error. And I'm happy to talk about some specific technical versions of that error. Uh, one of the things that concerns me a lot is there some, is there some deep bias in climate models that makes the results of solar geoengineering look better uh, uh, in the model than in reality. The other obvious question is, is it groupthink? Is it that those of us working on them have all kind of adjusted the models to produce these really good results? I think there are ways that we can get at that. And that is basically by having a diverse research program with lots of groups whose goal it is to, to find problems with these simulations. Okay, now I wanna spend the last five or eight minutes or so saying a little bit about the public policy of this and then really get going in a, a conversation to hear, hear questions and, and hear comments from the audience. So the first comment is just about my personal view and backed up a little bit now by some integrated assessment modeling work, but I don't personally have that much confidence in that anyway, um, about how it might make sense to use these things over time. And that is basically that, that if you, Think, we all know that if you have a, a, a scenario with fossil fuels forever, the net result is, is that um, um, climate risks just grow without bound. You know that if you stop emissions, uh, climate risks don't go down, they basically stay constant. You know that you could, with um, carbon removal, bring CO2 concentrations back down towards pre-industrial. I think there's no question about that. The questions are all about the, the relative timing, and I'm showing you right now graphs with no uh, units on the axes. Um, and I'm a little mixed up now because I'm out of out of the slides I thought I was going to show. Uh, I don't know why. Anyway, let me just say that to me, the way I think it would make sense to use solar geoengineering is to fill in, to use it to slice off the top of the curve here, which is the key thing I wanted to show with these uh, figures, but somehow I got the wrong slide as I adjusted slides for this presentation. But the idea is that solar geoengineering would start at some point, grow slowly, have a maximum about the same time as the point where net emissions went to zero, which is at about the same time as maximum climate risks. And then solar geoengineering will gradually stop as carbon removal pulled emissions back down. That's just a version of how to do this. To be clear, solar geoengineering can also be useful 
even if you don't have carbon removal, it can be useful just to slow the pace of, of climate change if it's useful at all. Um, but under the scenario that I'm showing you here, an important conclusion, uh, and a conclusion now out of uh, several integrated assessment models, is that you actually want to start solar geoengineering relatively early, but, but slowly, and because it needs to start a long way before this peak, peak of concentrations, peak of climate risk. Whereas if you believe that in general, it is um, uh, uh, cheaper to cut emissions than to emit and recapture, that is that in general, it's cheaper to cut emissions than do CDR, and that CDR's principal importance is in, um, in, in driving concentrations back down, then you want to start CDR, not exactly at the peak, but you want to start CDR, say, once you've cut emissions by two thirds or something. That's not to say it doesn't make sense to do lots of early testing CDR and you know actually deploying at small scale for sure, but really large scale deployment, I don't think makes sense while we still have really large scale emissions. And the consequence of that is contrary to what I think is common, the common view, which is that we have to cut emissions, that CDR is a, a second best if we can't cut emissions and that uh, solar geoengineering is a distant plan C if everything else fails. That's a kind of common view of the relative likability of these things. My argument would be maybe whoever holds that view is right about likability. I don't know what likability is, but in terms of time order, it actually makes sense to do solar geoengineering earlier in deployment terms than CDR when you think about the time dynamics of the problem. So I just want to say a little bit about research. So, so far I've just said, um, uh, uh, this is a big question about public policy. Obviously there's lots of research we can do just as little examples. Here's an example of a laboratory experiment we published on just uh, the end of last year uh, that, that showed that some earlier work we'd done on calcium carbonate in the stratosphere uh, didn't, wasn't probably as good as, as that earlier paper showing you the importance of empirical research. Here's an example of this empirical research, uh, this Scopex stratosphere controlled perturbation experiment, uh, which would actually measure particle uh, coagulation rates uh, uh, and some um, uh, aerosol background uh, um, uh, chemical reaction rates in the stratosphere. And um, this gives you some sense of, of, of the details of how we can actually learn about particle coagulation rates from this kind of quite small experiment that would release a kilogram or so of, of aerosols. But now I wanna say a little bit about the, pol the, the politics of it. So this gives you some view of what some people have said about these technologies. These are some old quotes, but you know, thinking a little bit about the, the really legitimate disagreements about um, what the next step in research should be. Um, uh, we are this stratosphere control perturbation experiment. We're trying to do the balloon flight in Sweden because of this uh, balloon provider SSC who happens to be there is particularly good um, uh, balloon provider, balloon operator that was the right one for us. Um, here's an example of, of what some you know amazing climate scientists are saying. Ray, Ray Beer Hubbard, one of the kind of people I respect most in the climate science world. Uh, uh, said that we were trying to co-opt the Swedish Space Corporation and to develop albedo hacking technologies without giving Swedish civil society a say and kind of liken what we were doing to as if we were helping the North Koreans uh, uh, build nuclear weapons. So that gives you a sense of just how strong the, the views are about, uh, about this topic. Um, so I'm gonna close with the following. Um, this is an old slide, but one where we now have some a little bit of new... Uh, new quantitative answers. So one very simplistic way to think about solar geoengineering is as a kind of two by two matrix of second order errors. Uh, obviously it's not really two by two, but, but you can think about solar geoengineering as either working or not working. And you can think about your expectation of it as either working or not working. And I think what almost all of us are worried about, any sensible person is worried about is dangerous overconfidence. Worried about th that we assume solar geoengineering works we find that it does not work. And then we've made all sorts of, of errors and caused huge harm on account of that. I think that's a completely legitimate concern, but I think it's important to think about the other sides of this concern. That, that we, if, if it turns out that in fact, solar generation works, which to me, of course, doesn't mean it works perfectly, but does actually produce a world with substantially reduced human and environmental risks. If we find that uh, prejudice or, or misinformation meant that we did not use these technologies and we look back in 2050 or something and realize we could have reduced climate risk a lot and we missed the chance to limit damages. So you can actually think about this as a kind of value of information story. We have a, um, 
a version of the DICE model now uh, calibrated with a version of solar geomesh engineering. And uh, we're actually playing around with, with uh, uh, trying to figure out the expected value of perfect information, basically the value of knowing more about solar geomesh engineering. And it's big, it's a border you know, with any reasonable calibration of order many trillions of dollars. Um, and sort of similar to the value, by the way, of reducing uncertainty and equilibrium climate sensitivity. And to me, that's part of the kind of fundamental argument, in this case, quantitatively, for actually doing research, for knowing more, for giving the next generation more information about whether solar geoengineering will work or not. Obviously, it's not binary, but more information about quantitatively about what the risks are uh, uh, and about what some of the side effects might be. And, and I'll say that 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 view that there should be significant research is actually quite widely spread. In a paper we published just earlier with a, uh, old colleagues at Carnegie Mellon are experts in expert elicitation. We had sort of 15 or so random IPCC authors, China, US, uh, and uh, median answer was about 5% of total climate science spending. We appropriate to spend that kind of money on a solar geoengineering research program. Uh, but obviously, many really thoughtful people disagree, and I think that's what I want to uh, get a conversation going uh, and, and hear questions about in the question and answer. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, David. That was a really fascinating talk. Um, and as, as you say, we'll now open the floor up to questions from the audience. Uh, I think we've already had quite a few come in, but please do keep them coming. Um, put them in the chat um, and we'll, we'll call on you um, in turn to, to ask those. Um, again, please try and include your name and affiliation when you do. Um, unmute yourself before speaking and then remute yourself again um, when, when your sort of part of the discussion has, uh, has come to an end. Um, but so I think we'll start with a question that came in from Roger. He's asked me to read it. Um, he says, I'm struggling to understand how CO2 from direct air capture is stored in geological formations. Is it stored in gaseous or liquid form within porous strata, or is it combined into some solid compound in caverns? Either of the first two would surely need enormous injecting energy. I can answer that, but it's like not remotely related to the talk. Do you want me to? I mean, I can. I mean, I've worked on this for a long time. There's standard answers. I was from an IPCC report. There's thousands of papers, but but I guess I feel like do. I mean, the short answer is there is immense industrial experience with injecting fluids underground, um, um, and experience with accidents and with regulation. Uh, there's some papers we wrote looking at a range of things from very toxic fluids like H2S to CO2 to other fluids in the U.S. experience. Um, there, there is, I think, lots of, of empirical basis for now over 100 years of experience with natural gas storage for confidence that we know something about this and that there are risks. And the answer is the injection energy uh, very much depends on how you measure it. But if you assume you've got uh, a CO2 at kind of 100 bar uh, pressure, uh, where it would be, depending on temperatures, a supercritical fluid, but they think of it as a fluid. Um, the injection energy, if you've already got it at that pressure, is very small compared to the capture energy, but that's kind of an accounting trick. It, it, the, the, the compression energy is significant. But again, I feel like this is just like pretty unrelated to what I was talking about. Well, well thank, you, thank you for answering it anyway. Um, I will move on to the next one. Um, Hans van der Loo, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? It's about decarbonization. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Ben. Uh, David, I really enjoyed your, your talk. Uh, my name is Hans van der Loo. I'm the chairman of the Institute for Integrated Economic Research. And I stress the integrated part because economic science is a pretty blinkered science in that it does not take into account the things that you talk about, physics, chemistry, and biology. We do a lot of uh, briefings of senior policy people. In fact, we have a big session next uh, Monday on the Clean Energy Transition Summit together with Sir David King. No doubt you've heard of him as well. And we're trying to make these kind of things uh, comprehensible to less technical policymakers. And the question that I have to you is basically a check of comprehension whether you would agree that basically there's a holy trinity in that you spoke about emissions reduction so both the Paris Agreement and the EU Green Deal have as a very explicit target net zero emissions. What I tell them is that we need that, but it doesn't solve anything. It only stops making things worse. And then I say there's a second tier that we must do that is actually tackle the root cause of the climate warming problem, 
And that's basically the carbon that has been moved from the subsoil geology into the atmosphere over the last 150 years. And you very eloquently explained that that needs to be done. But even if we were to do that, it will not avoid climate disaster because already two summers, and this of course is very much your field of expertise, we've seen that the balance between the ice growth in the winter and the ice melt in the summer is now negative. So we now have got net melting effect. And so I'm talking with a number of people. I've seen a few others here on the line, uh, including Emeritus Professor Stephen Salter uh, from the University of Edinburgh, who are also working on various technologies to achieve what you say, is to actually avoid this melting to trigger climate disaster in the forms of uh, excessive sea level rise. Now, would, th th my question is, would you say as a scientist that it is correct to present this to policymakers, indeed as an indivisible trinity, that you either do all three, or you might as well not do any of them, because if you only do one or two of the three, it will not avoid climate disaster. So for example, cooling without decarbonization, or cooling carbonization, but not doing the emission reduction, all of them would lead to climate disaster. So would you agree that it is a indivisible tri trinity that all three needs to happen to preserve the framework conditions of the human ecosystem as we know it today? Um, that's a, a great question. I mean, I think my simple answer is no, and I'll explain why. Um, uh, I, I do want to, one little codicil before I, I say my no, which is uh, you mentioned root cause. And I think it's, I think that the answer is there's no value neutral way to figure out what the root cause is. People have wildly different views. So maybe the root cause is CO2, but you could argue the root cause is capitalism or white males or, uh, or all sorts of things. Um, but I think to get to the core of your question, um, climate disaster isn't a scientific term. Disasters are determined politically. Uh, my view is the science tells us that the more CO2 in the atmosphere, the more climate hazards and the bigger the risk for sure, no question. But climate, but climate science does not produce a sharp threshold where below that you're safe and above that you've got disaster. It'd be very, very nice and easy for public policy if we had a sharp, unambiguous objective threshold, but we do not. So uh, given that I don't believe there is an objective threshold, people as voters with values can have different opinions. My opinion would be I'd want really rapid action, but that's an opinion. And it depends on trade-offs between rich and poor, you know, et cetera, present and distant future. My view is that it's perfectly credible to say that the primary focus should be on cutting emissions. And if we cut emissions quickly, we will still have climate change. As you've said, as, as I often say, cutting climate change to zero, cutting emissions to zero just stops the problem getting worse. But that's not, I don't think you can objectively say that that's a, a, a not acceptable policy. It's a policy that would greatly reduce risk compared to a world with emissions. But my view is, yes, I, I would like to see humans head back towards pre-industrial. And that means to pull the CO2 out of the atmosphere. But I think that itself is a sort of slow process over, over century timescale. But is, is it correct to look at all the trends that we see now that if we only would reduce emissions, but not do the decarbonization, global warming will continue with disastrous effects on sea level rise over the coming decades? So I'm not I, I, it, it alone is not enough. Yeah, so I'm not, my read, I'm not a sea level expert. I defer to friends like Richard Alley, who I think of as really the greats on this topic. And my read is that the sea level rise uncertainties are still pretty big. That the, the sea level rise uncertainties are big. They're mostly really next century where there's just really huge, deep scientific uncertainties about, um, you know, what might happen in Western Antarctic. Um, uh, well, maybe it's a side show. I absolutely agree that, I mean, I think we must decarbonize our economies. That the one thing I'll say is absolute. I think carbon removal, I'd love to see large scale carbon removal. There's no question, I, I think it makes sense. I just think it shouldn't be a substitute for emissions cuts early. And I think solar geoengineering is too early to say that we must do it. My view is that there's a strong case for doing research seriously. Um, uh, one last comment about, about sea ice, I guess, which is, in general, I don't think we need enormous new efforts on climate science. I think we know the climate science pretty well. But I think one place where there is a real public policy case for just spending a lot more money and resources is actually for a big push to understand uh, glacial ice sheet dynamics, because I think there actually are things we can learn that would reduce the uncertainty. Thank you. Thank you, Ben.
Yeah, thank you so thank you so much for that question. It was fantastic, and, and thank you, David, for the answer. Um, I think we've got a couple of questions now that I'll move on that are more focused toward risks. Um, I don't know whether so, Kevin Lister. Um, your question seems to be. I don't know whether you want to leave it as a comment or whether you'd like to unmute and um, and ask a question now. I think we'll leave we'll leave Kevin's comments as a just as a comment then. Um, Dave McAvoy, um, you've got a question. Would you like to unmute yourself and then ask it, please? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah my name is Dave McAvoy. Uh, I'm the chair of economics here at uh, Appalachian State University. And, uh, and as an economist, you know, some of the things that uh, we've been thinking about on this is the, the free driver hypothesis and, and variation in kind of optimal levels. And so I really like to see this uh, slide you put up with the different types of risks and thinking about risks when deployment is but benevolent. And I was just wondering in the modeling and in your thoughts, is that benevolence like a global decision maker or is this at the regional level? And and because it seems to me that it would matter quite quite a bit. It, it might matter quite a bit. I think um... I think, uh, um, um, I mean, to be clear, I think benevolence, I've been struggling with what words to use and I've gone back to dictionary definition. I think benevolence is a good word, but it often connotes like, you know, some kind of perfection. And I definitely don't mean it that way. I mean, I mean, real world groups of people in the political world we actually live in trying to apply these things in a way that's useful, but understanding that there will be divergent interests and mistakes and so on. I think that, that's the way I think about it. But, but I think there's a difference between trying to do things in a way that is broadly useful and I think the key thing is with some kind of minimax principle that I think would be what I would advocate for global governance, which is doing it in a way that has, has utilitarian benefits with the minimum harms, some kind of Pareto optimal principle. And I feel like that's the kind of thing that if we do need global governance for deployment for solar geometry, no question. And it feels like a core principle is don't make any area worse off. And obviously there's lots of uncertainties about what area means and so on, but I think that's the kind of principle that, that ought to be at the core of this. Um, I do think there's really interesting trade-offs between local and global SRM. Uh, many people's natural thinking is that local SRM is somehow much easier to govern or less risky. So you'll see people promoting ideas for adding reflective silica aerosols to Arctic sea ice or doing marine cloud brightening in little areas. And you'll hear people claim, well, it's just in a little area, it doesn't have a big global risk. If you just do something in a little area, it doesn't have a big global risk, that's true, but it also doesn't have a big benefit. And I think you have to compare things on an equal basis, comparing them for equal global or large scale benefit. And my view is the evidence is pretty strong that if you compare things on an equal benefit, that is if you compare two different things that produce say 0.1 watt per square meter global radio forcing, you could do that with a tiny amount of stratospheric aerosols, or you could do that with some marine cloud brightening in one region, uh, uh, both of those won't perturb the global climate very much because 0.1 watts per square meter isn't a big issue. Both of them wouldn't have a termination risk, et cetera. But uh, a, a strong local forcing from marine cloud brightening, let's say, or any of these local things will produce teleconnections, will produce local, will produce non-local climate changes that are significant or may. And, and my view is that in fact, it may actually be easier to govern and agree on something that's pretty locally even than a bunch of non-local things that produce teleconnections. And it's also true that most of the things that are local are inherently short lifetime. So cirrus thinning or marine cloud brightening have a lifetime of kind of day-ish. So that means that the termination shock problems and issues of weather control are inherently more severe than they are for, for surface, mostly surface methods or for stratospheric aerosols. Space space is an interesting difference, which in some ways is worse because you can principally terminate the whole thing very quickly with huge impacts. Thank you very much for adding those, those thoughts. Great, thanks for that question as well, brilliant. Um, I will move on now to a couple of questions. Um, first from Paul Rouse, um, and then I think we'll move on after that to another question that's related from Gideon Fusman. Paul, Paul Rouse, would you like to unmute yourself and, and ask your question? That's great. Thanks very much. Thank you, David. It was a super presentation. Um, I'm, try, I'm not sure I uh, crafted the question very well, nor whether I can oh, articulate Paul, you, you've eaten part of the mushroom and you're shrunk. I've shrunk? Kaiki. Go ahead. Sorry. 
How's that? Am I big and scary? No, 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 no you're the Paul. I know. No, big and scary. Okay. Yeah, that, so I'm not sure I articulated, wrote the question clearly or I can articulate it very clearly. But um, I was just thinking around the question of how do we move the research forward from the, the modelling to take physical science, natural sciences outdoors. Do you think it's now timely to have something like the, the Scopec test as a way to generate that conversation, to start a conversation going in the public domain amongst the policy world, the academic world. Um, and do you see that as being useful, perhaps even more useful than the outcomes of the test itself? Or do you think that's me just being a bit stupid? And the other question- First I've, of all, I would really, I mean, this is a contested issue, uh, but I think test is really not the right word. To me, test is something you do late in the development of a technology where you've got a well-developed technology that you were thinking of deploying and you're testing whether it works. Think so about that as experiment. You know, phase three of a vaccine trial. Yeah. And uh, this is absolutely not that. What we're doing at Scopex, we're not using hardware that's relevant for deployment. Nobody talks about deployment from balloons. They don't, they don't work for deployment. We're not using a sprayer that's relevant for deployment. We're doing something that's focused on a very narrow set of scientific questions really about the way aerosols interact in plumes uh, and aerosol chemistry. And so to me, the way I think about it is that's physical experiments, which uh, uh, will be used to uh, improve our models, which in turn predict the large scale response. And that's very much common to the way lots of other perturbative experiments in geosciences work. So there are lots of examples of geoscientists doing perturbative experiments. Uh, biologists do them where you you know, manipulate the ecosystem in some way, release some material to test some local relationship between two variables that then you build into a global model, which depends on these local observations to predict large scale impact. So to me, that, that's what we're doing. So I think a test really isn't the right view. And, and uh, my view is that, that, that um, there, there isn't, for my obviously not widely shared view, a sharp line between doing indoor research and outdoor, they're both research, there's a sharp line between doing deployment or anything that has a large scale impact, uh, but, but, but research always should have some empirical basis uh, from my perspective. Um, I think what maybe you're implying is there needs to be some kind of global agreement about research. Uh, and, and my view is that I really believe in the principle of subsidiarity, that we need global, uh, you know, things should be governed as close to the, the ground as they can be. And, uh, for something like deployment of solar geoengineering, you need global uh, agreement. But for research on anything, uh, uh, unless that thing produces some very acute risk from the research, the research should really be governed more locally. What I was trying to get to is, do you think the, the, the main value from small experiments like that will come not so much from the experiment itself and the new knowledge that it generates, but from the conversation that it generates? from the debate that it generates as a way of allowing the opening up of the conversation, which may or may not allow research to accelerate. I'm, I'm skeptical about that. I, I think that the, um, I think that in some ways, the, I think that to me, the big questions about solar geoengineering are really these big questions about deployment, about managing moral hazard. I mean, so, so to me, no. I think that obviously some of the opponents, people who really believe there should be no research in solar geoengineering, um, are, are trying to block scope X and other small experiments because they legitimately believe there should be no experiments, fair enough. But to me, I don't see that as serving um, as I see the public interest that much. Obviously I'm not determining, I'm just telling you my views because in my views, the big questions about solar geoengineering are really about overconfidence, about whether us scientists are too confident and wrong. And the other big questions are all about governance of deployment and about moral hazard and all that set of questions. And to me, these experiments don't really bear on either of those things very much. The experiments will help, I think, reduce overconfidence. Because I think the big one thing you learn is experiments produce messy, unclear answers. And, and, and experiments show that things are not as simple as they look in, in pure models. So my view is if people just rely on theory, they can be too excessively overconfident that the thing doesn't work or overconfident that it does work. And empirical experiments are kind of messy in a way that I think is healthy and reflects the real world. So to me, that's a benefit of doing these experiments. But I think, I think I worry that this focusing the larger legitimate hard question about solar geoengineering into a battle about whether small experiments should happen, I actually don't think is that helpful to public policy. But you know, you could say I'm just self-interested. 
<laughs> okay, that's fine. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, um, thank you, David. Um, Gideon, uh, you mentioned your question was sort of a follow-on from that. Would you, are you still, would you still like to open it up and ask it? Well, my question was actually a follow-on to Paul's second question, which you didn't get a chance to ask. Um, but um, it's essentially uh, related to this idea of ramping up. And I was wondering if ramping down would look different to ramping up. And I'm suggesting not just from a scenario, but obviously the rate where we remove might change and so the rate of that change. I'm talking about if the rate we remove after net zero mirrored the rate we emitted before, would the ramping down of SRM look different to the way the ramping up would? And what sort of tests um, and research beyond models, and obviously including models as well, could we do to kind of discover the answer to that question if it's not already been done? Do you mean the technical aspects of ramping up and down or how quickly did it, it ought to happen? Well, I kind of meant the technical uh, aspect, the, the, the broader kind of climate impact of the ramping down uh, and, and how quickly it ought to happen. So, so I'll share one slide. So, so there are now a few uh, integrated assessment models that are sort of toying with these things. And I've been involved in one of them. Uh, uh, I'm doing this wrong, sorry. Let me just share this one slide. Um, so this is an answer from some model variant. And remember, these models are ridiculously simplistic. And also they're modeling things from the perspective of a global benevolent dictator, which we most obviously do not have. Um, but, but in these models that are tempting, but th these models are not that's very important. These are the models that are so important to policy and shaping social cost of carbon. These models do show that the ramp up and ramp down looks roughly symmetric, but I could easily tweak parameters in the models and make it look asymmetric. So I don't, you know, that, that, that's kind of based on what you put in. Um, I guess to me, the big difference would be technological change. Um, that I think we're going to keep learning as we do this. And, and for me, if I think of the sort of peak of, of concentrations as being kind of a hundred year peak ish, well, 100, I mean, between 50 and 150, but it's not 10 years and it's not a millennia. If I think that the peak is kind of that long, then during the ramp down, that'll be a world where we really have different technologies. So, like the idea of space based solar engineering, where we've actually started to have some workshops, I think is laughable in the next few decades but actually not dismissible later this century. It may or may not be a good thing, but I think it's actually plausible you could build a space-based system. And then you might be able to do things like have it only work in the near infrared, where then you can actually manage both, um, you, you can do solar geometry and it doesn't change the surface energy balance. So, so I think the answer is different technologies. So maybe one last comment. I mean, I've been responsible for thinking a bunch of technologies that might be in some way better than, than sulfates, but I think, uh, sulfates uh, at, at low levels, we have enormous knowledge about because of, of all the history of studying sulfates. And so the unknown unknowns are much lower for sulfates. So it seems to me, people often ask me because I've worked on other things, calcium carbonate or whatever, that, that aren't those automatically better. And my answer is eh, not clear. Uh, 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 sulfates, because we have so much empirical knowledge might well be the right choice for public policy early on because we would have much uh, uh, more confidence that the uh, unknown unknowns were smaller. One thing I was wanting to get out of the question was also the kind of the nature of the climatic response to this, which is, let's say, a specific point on the ramp up where you've got specific greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere and specific amount of, um, you know, radiative forcing reduced by the um, zero geoengineering on the way up. Would that, how different or how, uh, or what, how similar would that climate look to the same set of conditions on the ramp down with the same population. Yeah, so, so, so for, for, for climate and climate models, the hysteresis isn't very big. The big hysteresis, the places where you really see differences are in ice sheets. I think one of the big questions that, that people really haven't looked at, we, you know, Richard Alley and I and some folks have talked about is like, if you had West Antarctica beginning to, to, to slide into the sea, does cooling the climate down with solar geoengineering stop it? I think the answer to that question is, is really nobody knows. There isn't a, a basis to figure that out. And that's a place where hysteresis might really matter. And there are also lots of climate impacts, ecological impacts and human impacts where hysteresis matters. But um, climate, there seems to be less hysteresis, I'd say. Great, thank you very much, Gideon. And thank you, David. Um, David, let me just check in with you quickly. How are you doing for time? Are you looking like you're 
needing to head I'm happy off. To, happy to keep going. I lost my opportunity to speak at the town council, okay. so that means I'm happy to get another 20 minutes or something. Okay, well, I'm sorry about okay. that, and, and thank no, you very no, much. I, for... I, that was, I, I warned them, no problem. Okay, well, th- we're very grateful for your, for your time, and I'm sure, as you can tell, lots of people are very interested in um, asking. So I will move on then to a couple of questions from um, Valerie Lavina. Um, Valerie, would you like to unmute and, um, and ask your question, please? Uh, hello, Barry Levina. Uh, I would like to answer, uh, ask about the um, choice of country. You mentioned that balloons in Sweden are available, but I thought that um, in California you would need uh, uh, more urgently to try some cooling because of the obvious uh, issue with the forest fires. And uh, also Swedish area may be affected by Arctic jets and uh, all other Mm, climatic uh, responses that may uh, bias the experiment if you perform it in those altitudes. And also I would like to ask about assessment of uh, life cycle of aerosols, because obviously you need to mine them somewhere, uh, uh, achieve certain um, roughness, uh, deliver them, it's all energy related. Uh, Was there uh, some life cycle assessment performed with the energy cycle? Thank you. Got it. So I, I didn't quite get some of the first part, but just to pick up, um, um, the, the scope experiment that we're proposing in Sweden is is a tiny scientific experiment. Obviously, there's very many people who, who oppose it, and maybe it shouldn't happen or won't happen. But just to be clear, we're talking about uh, a kilogram of material. So there's no climate impact. Uh, uh, not even I think the strongest critics would argue that. And um, what we care about are some really particular things in the stratosphere that are most of all about shear, actually. Um, uh, and so we're operating about 20 kilometers and what we care about is um, doing it during stratospheric turnaround where there's low um, wind speeds and having low shear um, and some issues about turbulence where we're making some new measurements with some um, German collaborators uh, about local turbulence. Uh, but those things are pretty generic to that part of the middle or lower stratosphere and we don't think it would make much difference uh, where, it, uh, where it was done. Um, and pretty irrelevant, I think, to anything about kind of uh, climate in Sweden versus California. Um, I guess the other question you asked was about life cycle costs of producing aerosols. The answer is almost nothing has been done on that. I mean, I think for sulfur, it's pretty clear that they'd be very small. There's been some crude effort. I have done a simple life cycle on delivery vehicles, uh, but for some other more fancy aerosols, there's been no work on life cycle and it would need to be done. But if you deposit certain amount, how long it will be staying at particular altitude and how often you need to recharge it. And when you deliver aerosol, it should be of particulate uh, quality. It cannot be kind of too big or too small. Otherwise it will deposit too quickly or it will be not delivering sufficient uh, density of this layer. It is a certain technology that should be maintained uh, yeah, so, 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 so the lifetime of aerosols in the stratosphere is about between one and two years, really depending on injection location and altitude. And um, there's significant uncertainties in stratospheric circulation and age of air, but those uncertainties are, are being reduced. Um, you're absolutely right that aerosol size matters a lot. Um, there's some opportunities for aerosol size control. So in experiments, numerical experiments, that we're doing with Max Planck Hamburg and some colleagues at ETH uh, and the NCAR model. We're looking at whether you can exercise some control of the aerosol size distribution by uh, injecting H2SO4 aerosols in an aircraft wake, which makes some uh, nucleation mode particles. And that gives you some uh, uh, size control. Uh, and it does appear to be true. There's some a paper that we wrote about a decade ago, but now we're seeing that that result is validated in these large scale 3D models. But that's where you'd really need to do experiments. I just uh, think that it's necessary to take into account all embedded uh, energy that uh, you use to launch this material. Yeah, that, that actually is, been, that, that, yes, that's a pretty easy calculation. Email me, happy to do it, but that turns out to be kind of thousand to one. It's not an issue. There's lots of bad things about solar geo, but that's not it. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valerie. Um, right, next, um, I'd like to ask Edward Kukla if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question if you're still here. Yes, I'm still here. Sorry for the darkness. Um, basically, in terms of these uh, calculations, I see cost benefits. 
uh, for CO2 in, in terms of thermodynamic terms. Um, but I didn't see any in terms of chemical terms. For example, there's acidification uh, of aquatic and marine systems. And uh, I was wondering if that was included, all, all of the chemical uh, uh, costs have been included in the, in the models. Uh, and if, if the uh, uh, subsequent mit mitigation of CO2 would, would improve the benefit or reduce the cost and therefore uh, allow for greater benefits. I'm not sure I completely understand. I mean, to be clear, nobody has done or is claiming some overall model everything cost benefit calculation of, of solar geoengineering. Indeed, I'm skeptical such a thing would make sense. Um, physical models that, that many people have used to study it do have carbon cycle models in them. And, um, and indeed, one thing that people often forget is to first order the ocean acidification and carbon content of the atmosphere is determined by net emissions, of course. But actually, solar geoengineering, by reducing carbon cycle feedbacks, does reduce atmospheric concentrations and therefore ocean acidification a little bit for a given, um, um, given anthropogenic emissions trajectory. But I'm not sure if that was answering your question at all. I don't think I totally understood your question. I think you covered it. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Edward. Thanks very much. And I think the next question I'd like to move on to, please, is from, I apologize if I pronounce your name wrong, um, Stuart Hazeldine. Yeah. Hi there. Uh, so I'm also from Edinburgh, like uh, Stephen Salter is. But anyway, my question, uh, David, is in the modeling you did where you speculated, used a model to speculate on the global effects of uh, solar radiation management. It seemed to be like an all or nothing approach. There was a benevolent dictator had seeded the entire atmosphere and you got global results in different patches. My question is, what if we've got messy politics and just one large individual state like the United States or a China or a Russia decides to try doing it on their patch of atmosphere? Does yeah. Have you investigated the predictability of that? Is that somewhat messy and incoherent? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, uh, to be clear, I'm I'm a little skeptical that people can model all these political um, sure. uh, costs, but I think there's useful things you can say. So to to I think there's useful things you can say that do not assume benevolence and do not assume everybody works together. So I think if you start from assuming that states have pretty strong self interests, where where the self interest of a state might be to just help their climate and hurt others. What you get, I think, which is kind of a lucky break, is that the solar geoengineering technologies that we most know how to use, which are, are, are um, stratospheric sulfates or stratospheric aerosols, tend to kind of want to be pretty global. So they certainly want to be uh, meridional. You can't make the materials just hang over one place. They always move around with the gesture mm -hmm. wing. You can, we've actually done a... Um, uh, um, transfer function perturbation of these models. And it turns out that for solar stratospheric aerosols, you have more or less four knobs or three knobs that when you do a sort of empirical orthogonal functions. You can make the equator more or less than the poles, and you can make one hemisphere more or less than the other. And that's kind of about it in terms of real controls. Um, I think if you think about it from the perspective of one self interested state, knowing the political reactions. It's important to say that states are self-interested, but they think about political reactions. If you have a choice of either deploying pretty evenly globally and providing your country with X benefit, or providing or, or deploying in a way that just benefits your country and screws the other people, and the benefit to your country about the same in both cases, and the cost is small, and I believe those are actually all the things that apply, then you're going to want to do it evenly anyway even that though you're still a country acting your self-interest, because you know that if you just do it locally and screw the other guys, they're gonna come back at you somehow through trade sanctions or they'll block you or whatever. So I think what we think about is kind of mini lateral coalitions where groups of countries would choose to do this. And luckily because of the physics of the stratosphere, they might choose to do it in ways that were pretty even because they know that if they're doing it in a way that makes one area really badly off, there's, they can confidently expect there will be political pushback. And that's not a claim about benevolence, it's a claim about realistic self-interest in a multipolar world. Okay, so that's a sort of game theory type approach in the way that everybody benefits ultimately. Yeah, and I think there are lots of, to be clear, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean you get to a perfect answer, but I think that 
the obvious concern, if there was a solar geoengineering technology that really strongly benefited one place and made other places a lot worse off, there's no question there'd be real risks of it being used. But luckily the technologies that we're actually developing mostly seem not to have that feature, but mm -hmm. maybe they will turn out to have it. There's no question we need global governance. But, <laughs> but on the other hand, but lots of things that humans do muddle through without perfect overarching global governance still achieve reasonable outcomes. Yeah, well, I mean, we, we're busy doing that all the time at the moment, I guess. So. Exactly. We don't have a magic global governance for vaccines, but we've actually are achieving an outcome that's not the optimal, but not hideous. Okay, that's great. Thank you for your answer. And thanks, Stuart, for your, for your question. I thought that was a really interesting one. Um, I'd like to move on now to, to Richard Simon. Uh, Richard, if you'd like to unmute yourself, please. Hi, David. Thanks very much for the talk. Um, my question's about what are the next steps needed on solar ge and geoengineering? You mentioned research funding. What else is there to, to go forward? Do we need a conversation at COP around um, the value and likability of these technologies? Uh, do we need policy on deployment or does kind of the low TRL level mean that we're 20, 30, 50, 100 years away from deploying some of these? There's not a low TRL level for 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 stratospheric aerosols, you basically could do it now in a crude way. And I think everybody's looked at it seriously agrees with that. Um, uh, for other, other ones, they're very low TRL levels, or, or it depends. But I think that's not the core problem. Um, I think the answer, and sorry to use jargon, technology readiness level. Um, um, so I think in answer to your bigger question, I'd say the following. I think there's two broad things we need. One is some kind of not necessarily global, but something that's a closer to global consensus, which might be a UN General Assembly resolution or something else could be declarations by major states that restrains unilateral action. I think the key thing that everybody's scared about is unilateral action or one of the key things to be scared about. And I think there needs to be something that restrains early unilateral action and that without asking for some global consensus, which is never gonna happen, uh, 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 tries to set a political climate where there's a real possibility for research, but research under a kind of a, some soft um, um, barrier. So there's a, a, a so it's, it doesn't easily slide into deployment. I think that's really crucial. And so that's at the level of international politics um, or governance. And then I think the other thing we need is just a broad research program. And um, uh, I said something about the scale research program I think is appropriate. I think it's important to say you could make very quick progress in my view, because this is not a wholly new technology. This is not in some states a new technology at all. It's really adapting a bunch of individual technologies and pieces of science we already have for aerosols in the troposphere or aerosols in the stratosphere, for making aerosols, for atmospheric science, for remote sensing observation that's applying those things to this uh, uh, new problem. Um, I think I'd say one thing about the design of a research program. I think it's important that research programs not be single centralized entities because politically single centralized entities tend to come up with single answers. And my view is the big concern here is credibility, the public having confidence in the answers and, um, and, and, and risk of groupthink. So, so my view is research should be organized with a relatively small number of groups who are trying to proactively figure out how these technologies could be developed in the public interest in ways that they are deployable to produce large scale benefits with small harms. That is trying to kind of do the figuring out how to make it work. And then many more groups independently trying to figure out all the ways that those groups are wrong, all the ways that they made specific errors or, or technically incorrect assumptions or, or, or problems with the uh, political assumptions embedded. I, I think it's important that those be independent groups not one kind of big organization that includes both the kind of pro and anti, if you like. I think things work better when people independently can critique things. And I think we need to build up a, a system that does that. Some people have critiqued folks like me as being part of the geo clique. And I think that's a fair critique. And I think it's really important that we have a much more open global research effort uh, that is more representative of humans, uh, of different nationalities, races, sexes, et cetera, obviously. Uh, but also uh, really different scientific disciplines and organized into different organizations. Thanks very much. Um, just one follow up around the, um, you mentioned the likability of the technologies and the other impacts. Are we there yet? Do we understand uh, on stratospheric aerosols enough of those impacts to have 
a conversation like a climate assembly conversation with the general public to understand and decide whether or not this is this is a reasonable thing to do. Ha. Uh, uh, um, um, I mean, the answer is always going to be yes and no. So, I mean, the answer is the, the conversation is happening in the general public now. Um, um, or in lots of different publics. Uh, I would say, I would caution that, that people often want to know what the public thinks. And there's a lot of evidence from risk perception and study of public understanding of new technologies that the public doesn't usually have robust views of things that haven't been well debated. So to take parochial US examples, people do have pretty well-formed opinions about things that have been actively debated for decades, like abortion or gun control. But for new technologies that really haven't been subject to active debate, like human reproductive technologies or gene drive for mosquitoes or cellular geoengineering, uh, uh, people don't have opinions, and it's possible to develop a public or another, depending on how you tweak the survey. My view is that experts also were kind of captured by their own little in-group viewpoints, and I think that that the what I'd like, why I think it's most important for, for governance actually, for, for emerging technologies like this generally, to get my kind of big idealistic answer, is we do more things where we take small groups of randomly selected citizens and give them plenty of time to, to get evidence and figure out themselves what they think, calling evidence from different experts to, to produce probably not, not binding uh, uh, answers, but produce highly influential answers about what should happen. So I would put much more faith in small groups of people like that than I would in my peer experts who are kind of captured in their own uh, group thing. So if, if you're looking to how legitimately to make decisions about this technology that's that, or other similar emerging technologies, I personally favor methods like that. Many thanks. Thanks, David. Uh, thank you very much, Richard. And um, we're on to our penultimate question now then, uh, which is from Stefan. Um, Stefan, would you like to unmute yourself, please? Hi there. Um... I was just having a, just a quick question about, has there actually been direct comparisons between the impact of geoengineering on health and ecosystems versus the climate? So if it was to end up, we're in a position where we're going to do these geoengineering um, uh, experiments, should, should we say that actually we might be worse, worse off versus with, with the climate impacts or vice versa? By experiments, do you, what do you mean by experiment? So um, you were talking about running, um, you know, we're not going to test it. We're going to do, do these experiments, should we say. And then if we do go on, go on and test them, have the, if you were to run these experiments, has the actual uh, health impacts been, so you said, I saw a slide earlier on, you saw there so, might be so impacts of ground level ozone, et cetera. I, I think experiments are generally going to be tiny because they're trying to understand atmospheric processes. And I think most experiments that people will, scientists would want to do on these topics would be at a scale much too small to cause significant impact. So the experiment we're talking about doing in Sweden releases as much sulfur as one minute's flight of a commercial aircraft. Uh, so not zero risk, but that gives you a sense of the scale. But actual deployment, are you asking about what the relative risks and benefits are of deployment? Yeah, ultimately in the end, yes. I have, have a small experiment, has this been done on smaller experiments to view what the larger scale that's not, it's not, that's not the, I think, I think that's a misconception about, you don't just do little experiments and scale them up. That's not how science works for things like this. The experiments are designed to answer questions about specific atmospheric processes. And then you use information about those processes in scientific models, like, like general circulation models to try and predict what the outcome would be. That's what we do for other air pollutants uh, and for climate indeed. Uh, so it's, it's not as if, you know, when we're trying to understand the, the current risk of, of, of different air pollution chemistry, for example, we don't just do bigger and bigger experiments. We do specific process experiments to try and figure out what's wrong with our models. And then we use those models to predict what the consequences are of say, you know, some people believe we should use lots of ammonia as a, a energy carrier to reduce, um, you know, uh, to, to power ships or airplanes. And, uh, we, it's not like we just have, need to experiment with lots of ammonia. We, we, we have atmospheric models that are calibrated based on experiments we can use to figure out how many people will die from particular air pollution uh, given ammonia with some leakage. Is that is that helpful? I feel like we're talking past each other. Yeah, I was um, maybe it was just my language of uh, experiments might have been in, in, incorrect there, but it was more just um, in, in the long term, 
um, so experiments could I, be done by modeling or it could be done in, in, in person, I was meaning. I don't think, I don't think you do a large scale experiment, you deploy. We only have one world, you know, multiple worlds. In the end, there will be deployment or there won't be. And even after deployment, we won't know for sure what the effects are, which is true of any technology. Uh, um, I can give you one slide if you like to try and I think one, one thing I think you might be asking is about the relative scale of say the health and air quality risks um, uh, of deployment from what we know now with uncertainties compared to the benefits. Is that a question? Yep. Okay, so I, I can give you one version of that quantitatively. So uh, several groups, including uh, a group I collaborate with at, at MIT has done a bunch of work on this air pollution risk. So this is with a specific scenario now of, of a million and a half tons of sulfur a year in stratosphere. So not necessarily optimal, it's just a scenario. So um, that, that you got to compare that to the roughly 50 million tons a year of sulfur we're putting in the lower atmosphere right now. And you can think about the climate impacts of that. And then let's see if I can move this slide forward. Yeah, so for mortality estimates, um, the mortality estimates, the, the, from our paper, but there's about four papers that have had similar numbers. The, mortal, the direct mortality estimates from that are these, these numbers that are of order tens of thousands, and that, some of them are negative. It's kind of complicated because it reduces some mortality, increases others. And those numbers are tiny compared to the expected benefits of solar geoengineering on, on heat mortality. A tiny mining, meaning by several orders of two orders of magnitude. So, so the evidence from several papers, but we don't have a single complete paper that does it, is that if you use solar geoengineering to reduce peak temperatures on a global basis, late in the century, you'd be uh, reducing peak mortality from, from, from peak temperatures by numbers that would be much, much larger than these uh, indirect air impacts from air quality. Is that the kind of question you're asking? Sorry, yeah, I would it incorrect. This is exactly the kind of question I was meaning to, yeah. to get at. So the answer is this is a crude, nobody's done this in a systematic way. This is like a crude slide, but our paper doesn't even really have this comparison in. You'll notice my slide, I'm quoting the 60,000 a year mortality. This is from one paper that I really trust in the US, but I couldn't actually find a good paper for global mortality. So I'm kind of, some of what I just said is kind of a guess. I think it's a challenge to the community to begin to actually do these things in a serious way. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you, Stefan. And we've got one last question, if that's all right, David, um, which is from sure. Jake, who's an environmental engineering student here at Imperial. Um, Jake, I, I, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask, um, that'd be great. Hi, um, my question is quite general, really. It's just that how can young people, such as myself, that I'm a current master's student, how can young people get involved in uh, SRM and, and the SRM sector, really, that's, that's kind of going to develop in the future? Well, first of all, I don't really think it's a sector because I don't think it's ever going to be a business on a significant scale. I think this is this is really an application of existing. It is really mostly about about science uh, uh, and some technology development. And my guess is if it, if it ever is done, it'll be done by governments. Uh, um, uh, but I think the answer is is getting involved in earth and atmospheric sciences or the public policy side is is the way to do it. But the other way is politically. Is is you know we sort of hinted at it in this conversation. There are very strongly divergent opinions about whether there should be research. And there are serious, thoughtful um, scientists and serious environmental groups that argue that there shouldn't be research. And um, obviously that's not my position, but, but, but they do. And I think one thing that, that youth can do is, is make their own voices heard and, and um, say what they think, whatever it happens to be. I think the youth voice in this debate has really been missing. I've been talking with some people from uh, the Sunrise Movement in the US and I've got a really interesting, diverse set of opinions, actually much more positive than I expected, but maybe that's a selection bias of the ones who come to talk to me. But uh, I think getting getting the some youth voice to weigh in will be really important. Now, I guess I'll end with one interesting thing. There was a study done by um, Masahiro Sugiyama at University of Tokyo, who was trying to probe um, whether opinions about solar geoengineering, research and deployment were, whether basically people in countries that were more vulnerable, poorer, were more in favor or less in favor than country, richer countries. He focused on Asian countries. And he used a very interesting sample, which was to use undergrads, which is a nice way to control for age and roughly control for education in doing his survey. And uh, he found, I think it's fair to say, much larger support for research um, than would be true if you sampled kind of elite climate experts, um, uh, which is an interesting kind of difference, sampling Asian youth versus elite climate um, experts. 
and he also did find that the support was stronger in the poorer countries, which I think is consistent with kind of the fact that that um, in rich countries, it's easy to think that we can kind of afford to not to just dismiss these technologies because we're going to cut emissions at the pace we do. But in poor countries where the climate impacts are really going to be acute and where um, people will be most likely to suffer, uh, it's uh, um, harder to, to dismiss, I think, the um, utility of technologies like this. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank well, thank, thank you very much, everyone. Um, I'll just wrap up by saying you know, thank you so much to David for um, for giving us so much of your time. I thought the talk was was really interesting, and I, I really produced a, you know, a very sort of thought-provoking discussion afterwards. I hope, hope you think so as well. Um, next month, same Changing Planet seminar uh, will be with uh, Joyce Msuya, who is the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations and Deputy Executive Director of the UN Environment Programme. That'll be on Wednesday, the 28th of April at 4 p.m. And Joyce will be speaking about how we can build a green economy in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I'll just finish um, this event by, again, saying thank you so much to David for joining us, uh, and thank you to everyone else for uh, being part of the audience. I, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. So thank you very much. Thank you all for your time. Thank you very much. <laughs>